introduction. Uh, he was here last year, did a phenomenal presentation, and got so excited about some of the people that he met. He actually hired them. Uh, and he flew in from Florida today uh, to say hello. You didn't have any long flight delays, which is always nice to know. Um, only because I was looking for you earlier, but I don't know, okay, let's see. Let's do flight tracker and see what kind of damage we've really done. Uh, so, interrupt. Um, another way of saying that is I want to create boring jobs in space. Um, 
And you know, that to me is sort of a misnomer because well, if you like that, how can you actually have a boring job? So kind of give you some background on like where 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 we could come from and where we're going um, before we get into like where we're going next. Uh, let's talk a little bit about launch logistics and why manufacturing in space or use of space is important. So everything we've ever sent to space goes kind of on these really amazing vehicles, rockets. These are the things that make every like four-year-old fall in love with space, right? They're big, they're loud, they're they're shiny. Uh, but they also subject every single thing we've ever seen in space to like this really high G, high shock, high vibration environment, which, you know, as engineers, we know uh, drives a lot of requirements. So it turns out like 95% of the requirements for getting something to space are driven by these guys. And but when you send something to space, it's only on a rocket. Like once you light the rocket, it's only on that rocket for like 10 or 15 minutes, and then it's. And it's in the operational environment for 10 or 15 years, and in, in zero G, in an environment that's really, really benign, really friendly. So this is a bit like, you know, for whatever reason, um, having a requirement that if you're going to take your kid from your house to your school, um, you need you need like a tank. You know, it seems kind of silly. So it's also very expensive to design. Um, it's like a test. Um, survive a launch because the launch providers say, hey, we want to make sure your satellite doesn't like fall apart and break a rocket in the way. Uh, and we also want to make sure it works in space. So it becomes very expensive. Uh, and you also have to smash everything into the top of the little fairings on top of these, um, which you know, those aerodynamic fairings to make sure the rocket can get through our atmosphere. Uh, and what that requires is deployables, which basically are sort of like, you know, origami folding up something. Uh, so it fits in that fairing once it gets to space. We and those are very, those are prone to fail. So, you know, we sort of asked the question, like, hey, what if you just sent, like, a robust manufacturing facility to space and then raw material? Because we're, you know, like feedstock, the three current stock, for example, doesn't care how much Jesus objected to. It's you know, just going to be a power. It's one of those. There. So, all of this, uh, all of that thought kind of resulted in, in in this guy right here in 2014. So we, as a company, um, you know, said, hey, we think manufacturing in space is really important uh, because of all the reasons that I just talked about, and we want to we want to see what we can do. So we uh, cajoled NASA into giving us uh, a parabolic flight opportunity. That's the bottom comment where you kind of go up, and we drop for 20 seconds in your weight list, and then you have this nice 2G pullout, and you do that again and again. Uh, and we tested and validated uh, space capable, you know, uh, gravity independent 3D printing on on that vehicle, uh, and that that success uh, was able to get the attention. That sort of like basically benchtop test was able to get the attention of NASA. NASA said, "Hey, we we'll give you a little bit of money. See what you can do. Get pretty good. I guess a little bit of more money." Um, and then after that second round, about three months later, we built this guy, which is called 3D Print. Um, which is kind of the beating heart of brands of a 3D printer that works in space. Uh, and ultimately this was launched on a SpaceX rocket in 2014, installed, and then manufactured a whole slew of parts. Uh, also, really, really importantly, uh, manufactured parts that we had not sent the files to space for. So we sent a whole bunch of files, did a whole bunch of interesting tests, a bunch of like, material uh, characterization, printing, uh, and then actually responded to the needs of the astronauts uh, on the station. And they said, hey, I'm missing, I'm missing a thing. Uh, and so to be more specific, this is Commander Bush Bullhorn. He was the commander of the International Space Station when we were running in 2014. Uh, and he, like, uh, he, he had actually misplaced his ratchet. Because uh, ISS is like the size of your house, the size of a decent house. Uh, and but and you know like you and your home you probably misplace this, um, and and but we have the benefit of gravity. If I you know, drop this remote, it's going to just stay there. Uh, but in, you know, I this is compounded by the fact that it push, you know something slips out and slips out of, out of hands. Who knows where? So we misplace this ratchet, and we we're like, oh, this is amazing. Like we can demonstrate the ability for this to like responsibly uh, solve a problem. 
even if it was just a, you know, a little loss for engine. Uh, so we actually designed up a single print uh, uh, ratchet in what, like, like a day or two, uh, and then got NASA safety to approve that thing on station, because there's always this safety process just things to space. And then we had to wait around for Butch to be ready to like take out print. So we waited for like three days, and then finally like, Butch is going to be ready. So we emailed the file to the print, three and a half hours, three and a half hours later, that picture which having a fully functioning ratchet in his hand, and it actually ratchet, got incorporated and all that kind of stuff. You can download the plans off of uh, our website, NASA's website, and all that other places. Uh, so yeah, that was, we were really proud of that. So we've taken this and now extended it further, because, because this guy really is kind of, a, like I said, the beating heart and brain of 3D printing in space. Prints and ABS, which, you know, everybody's familiar with, we are computer robots. Um, and it lives inside of a glove box that contains all the contaminants and, and is like, it, and, and is a really valuable piece of, piece of uh, real estate on the station. So what we need to do is make a more capable printer. And we, because we want to see people live in work in space, we want to see the needle move on commercial and government international activities in space, actually made a commercial facility on stage. And that's this guy's thing. Um, the added manufacturing really good at being this. Um, this is the first commercial in-space manufacturing service. So you can actually, we have customers right now, and we have about six months of customers. We've been printing for about six months now. Um, you can actually call us up. We will make some, we will manufacture stuff in space or for use there, or for, or for study there, and ultimately down asking. It's, it's like, it's a contained unit on its own. It's got its own environmental control system, so it's a lot of like noxious fumes to harm the astronauts. Power, computing, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and it prints in like some pretty interesting materials. Um, and it can also print much wider variety of materials, uh, which is what we flew with green. Um, and so this is a pretty, you know, this is an important step uh, because like four years ago, there weren't any companies like operating on the International Space Station uh, from a commercial basis. Like Boeing built the International Space Station and makes it. And you know has you know, maintenance contracts. They're very, very large. There's like two or three billion dollars a year. There's no station. But there weren't any companies that were like, hey, just give me a little bit of space, and I'm going to do stuff and generate value. I'm going to you know, kind of going back to hey, like how do we open the frontier? We open the frontier by, by generating by, by generating economic activity that's tied to this place. So that's really what this guy, you know, very very early on represents. And this is a. A cool picture of a part that we made for uh, a design competition for uh, for future engineers for this organization called Future Engineers. It's a like a, uh, an astronaut hand tool that, that was developed by I think a high school. So the real so so that technology is really important and really kind of forms the, the bedrock of of where I think where we think it made in space the future, the actual future of, of you know, commercial and government activity in space really, that, you know, we've had, we, 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 you know, for 40 or 50 years now, the way we, we've utilized space has been sending people to do exploration and bouncing signals off of satellites. So, you know, manipulating ones and zeros through space, or listening to things, or looking at things, or sending intelligent signals back and forth, and you know, sending communication. Uh, actually manufacturing, processing things in space, we believe really will open up this frontier. Uh, and why, why, why are you manufacturing and processing in space? Well, the answer is, the space environment is really cool and unique. Um, it, there's, no, there's no gravity. Uh, in Leo, we have, we have this amazing atomic oxygen environment, um, which is really good or really bad, depending on what you're trying to do. The radiation environment, uh, you know, it's got a high radiation environment. Um, and also the EM spectrum is different in Leo than it is on the ground, due to, you know, because you don't have the sort of atmosphere. And all of these things are really important if you, if you just kind of think about, like, how do we actually make things on the, on the ground today? The way we make things on the ground today is usually we take raw material and we put it in, 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 in a non-typical environment, like a, like a furnace in the most basic form, and, and that alters the product and that generates properties that are interesting to us. So if we can send stuff to this environment and leverage these unique properties, 
that we can create new materials uh, and value added processes. So what, so, so what are the kind of classes that we can actually do this for? Or what are the potential classes that we can do these things? Well, there's a few. Uh, optical classes are an interesting one, on fiber. Uh, metal, actually metal processing. Uh, actually, if you go all the way back to Apollo 14, uh, NASA and you know, its spacefaring brethren have been doing like very like sort of benchtop you know, processing experiment. So on Apollo 14, they flew like metal ingots and they heated them up in, you know, in I think it was in Leo, and actually saw that all the, but they and saw that the, you know the metal was actually stronger when they brought it down to Earth for, for, for analysis. Uh, and NASA's actually been doing uh, over, you know, since then it's been doing these very kind of piecemeal uh, experimentation to, to to really explore, you know, a lot of the, you know, explore and lay the initial you know, low TRL development work for for some of these things. Uh, semiconductors is another interesting one. Uh, you know, a lot of semiconductors are, are made uh, with you know, a very high vacuum environment. I mean, what is space? A really high vacuum environment. Um, and, and finally, bioprinting. Um, specifically, like making like vascularized tissues. Uh, it, there's a lot of research that says, hey, we don't actually think we can do that. Um, just manufacture vascularized tissue in gravity. So let's go to space and we can make things. And we can actually do that. Uh, there's, a, there's a company uh, that a colleague of mine uh, runs called Tetra, and they, they're actually trying to make heart valves in space, which is like this incredibly <coughs> high value thing, right? Um, if you could make heart valves for people, uh, that would you know, justify the cost to kind of go up and up and down. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges, because these are all, this is how we drive, you know, this, this sets up the economic argument uh, for or against, and also sets up our engineering sort of constraints. Um, if you want to do processing and manufacturing in space, we're going to get there. Um, this is a picture of the rocket that our, three, our first three printer went up on. Uh, and it was, you know, a night launch, it was amazing. Uh, this is a drag, this is a SpaceX rocket, uh, CRS-4. Um, this is not as easy as it, this is not um, as automatic as we would like, right? Like, Three launches later, going to station, that rocket blew up. Uh, like, launch before that, an orbital, orbital anti-K's rocket blew up. So, the, the Russians, <laughs> uh, see, you know, uh, have, have trouble every couple of years. Uh, so going to space is, is hard. Uh, and you, you, and kind of going back to the kind of interesting conversation about uh, about APIs that we earlier in layering, we just kind of trust that those guys are going to do their job. Uh, so we hand them our payload and they fly it, and you know, God willing, it gets there. So once you get to space, you have to operate. Um, and ISS is a great. So we, we do a lot of operations on ISS. So we'll talk about that. Like there are, you know, six people on ISS that can do stuff, uh, but those people are incredibly overbooked. Uh, so as a, as a, as a, so you can't always rely on people to like do the work for two reasons. One is that they don't have much time. And two is that they're really brilliant. But they're not necessarily brilliant about your stuff. Uh, to give you kind of an interesting example, we you know, we do 3D printing on station. We command the printer from the ground. We upload the files. We do all those things. The only thing we rely on astronauts for is for them to literally come over our machine and take a part out, put it in a bag. Takes like five minutes. We get like. One pull a week, so like five minutes a week to, to mess with our stuff. So you, so you really want, so we try as much as possible to make this as you know automatic and robotic and teleoperating, uh, which you know, is more challenging than having like an expert there, you know, turning your dials. Then you, have to, then you have to get it back, and and you have to use it. And getting it back means that you know the the drag capsule when it comes back it subjects it to about three different genes. So Manufacture stuff in space, zero G environment, it still has got to go through that, you know, go through some uh, interesting uh, force environment. So there are other kind of considerations, and this is this is important not only from a you know from kind of a, the business side of things, but this is important from an engineering side, right? Because we have to solve these problems in order to make it worth our while to do things. Um, we have to agree we're not making stuff in space is that it costs thousands and thousands of, or tens of thousands of dollars to send stuff to space. 
As a for instance, that guy right there, the Dragon Capital. Uh, uh, SpaceX charges NASA, I think, about $180 million a launch, which I think works out to about $60,000 kilo dollars a kilogram to get stuff off the back. So, and that, so to get stuff off, you can buy a rocket from them and get, you know, maybe like $10,000 a kilogram. But to get it back, because you have to get it back, or else it's not worth anything, uh, from the manufacturer. Um, right now, it's sort of like the owner rate's about $16,000 a kilogram. And you have to buy the whole rocket. You can't just buy like a little piece of it. So that's a very important, you know, so that's a really important number to say, okay, I'm gonna make stuff. So, you, so we're talking about making stuff that's high value, high impact. Like, like the heart valve is a really good one because that stuff is expensive. What are you, how are you gonna operate? What are you, where's your process of equipment gonna come from? How much material, how much, what is the actual addressable market that you're gonna have at the end of the day? Um, you know, because if you spend $100 million developing something and you can, and the economics work, but you're only gonna be able to sell like $10,000 like, of stuff a year, it's not a good deal. So those things need to balance out. Uh, you know, other sort of operational considerations are, you know, what, what organizations do you need to be involved? You need, you need a launch provider. If, you, if you're gonna go to ISS, you have to negotiate with NASA. Uh, you know, who's going to operate it? Are you going to operate it? Do you have the experience to do that? Um, are you going to, or are you going to pay somebody else to do that? Um, how reliable do you want other folks? And how reliable are you those folks? You know, like we talked about with rocket launch, rockets explode. Um, you know, how, how, if, if you lose or if you lose a payload, are you sunk? Or are you, you know, or are you resilient to that? So, all of these factors, you know, if you start with, hey, first, you know, the first thing is you need, you need, you need, you, need, you know, the, the raw dollars on right? Today, let's just say it costs $60,000 to get something like that. That means that you have to charge at least $60,001 a kilogram to, you know, to have any market. Uh, and then you have, you know, pay for the equipment and pay for the raw materials, and then you also have to say, hey, is this something that, am I just 5% better than, you know, what they're doing on the ground and somebody's going to be able to beat that? Uh, or can they drop that price and affect me that way? Uh, how much, and then how much material do I actually need to make in order to be viable? Is it, is it a small amount or, you know, to address the entire market, or is it a huge amount to be viable? Neither one of those really work. Uh, so those are kind of the factors. So you know, we've kind of done that analysis, and we've looked at all these things, and looked, where we've kind of landed is there's actually an optimal fiber called Zebra that has, a, has an addressable market today, it's a good science and is potentially like just incredibly disruptive to silicon fiber that we can, we can manufacture this in space at scale. Um, and at a scale that we can fly like a couple of rockets a year do and you know really change change the way we're doing this. So let's talk about Zeeland. So Zeeland is a fluoride optical fiber uh, that, and if you look at this chart on your right, the blue one, um, this is really what we're kind of going after. So Z-Land theoretically has a very wide, has an incredibly wide transmission window, uh, deep in the IR, it goes from visible deep in the IR, and it has really low, has better signal loss, better attenuation than silicon fiber. So the red line there is the theoretical best for Z-Land, and the yellow is the theoretical best for silicon fiber. Silicon fiber is Sort of normal run of the mill hot fiber. And as you can see, it's like 10 to 100 times better depending on the wavelength you choose. It, it's, uh, it's that theoretical best. So, why, are, why, are, you know, why don't we use Z land in all of our you know, data transmission needs? The answer is scattering, uh, absorption, and scattering. This material was first formulated in the 70s, and the best that we've been able to do with even modern technology is the chart on the left there. Uh, you can see that you know, we're at about like one TB per kilometer where, you know, rather than like 0.01 TB per kilometer in the, in the best case. Um, the absor so absorption, uh, and basically there's a, these are absorption and scattering both cause like imperfections in crystal and lattice. And the absorption, absorption is if you get like impurities in the lattice when you're, when you're making fiber. And you get these like kind of absorption spikes. And you can see those, you know, at like two, 
I had two microns and three microns for a little bit. Uh, but we got, but you know, there are a lot of people who've done a lot of work who've actually been able to make really, really pure glass and kind of eliminate that. Um, but then there's also the scatter. Because when you pull this fiber on the ground, little micro crystals form. And each, each crystal, you lose like 4% of the light. And so then your attenuation is completely shot. Well, NASA, um, kind of also going back to the previous video, NASA, starting in the 90s, kind of funded a series of very basic research um, experiments and flights, studying Zeeland and pulling and, and pulling Zeeland in microgravity on parallel flights, got little 20 second jobs, and showed that you can actually repress the formation of these crystals if you do that in supergravity. So we're using that microgravity environment to make better product. Uh, and you know, so they funded some kind of you know some government research companies, uh, and then you know, and then after the, after the NASA money dropped, dro dried up, they didn't, you know, they they stopped with the research. Which so, which I think is kind of which is kind of interesting, maybe uh, uh, disappointing, because today even with that kind of bad transmission spectrum, Zeeland is used in a lot of uh, in, in some. Some interesting kind of narrow applications. We actually use it for uh, some, some endoscope applications, super continuum light sources, uh, uh, defense cell, uh, uh, defense sensor applications, um, even some like manufacturing and cure applications. The stuff that's used. It's got a curve. It's a pretty, it's a decent size market. Now, if you can get, now if you can repress that that scattering and you can get below the silica fiber, then we can actually access the their future applications. They're making the server farms more efficient, and there are the long haul telecommunication. So this is because if we can actually, if we can, if we can lower our attenuation or for a long haul communication line, we can actually reduce the number of repeaters, which boosts the signal all along the way. Um, if you reduce the number of repeaters, you, you reduce response time, and you know, and response time is king for long for long for long haul communications. Um, you know, there are. There's like one or two billion dollars a year spent on putting new lines, new fiber in the ocean. Um, and just as for instance, there was a, uh, a consortium you know, that spent three hundred million dollars to lay a line from like New York to London to shape like you know, you know just like two or three milliseconds off of their response time. Uh, this could do so much more than that, uh, just a little bit better, uh, you know, a little bit better, uh, you know, attenuation. So. There's a market today for this. There's a market in the future. We really think that this is the very first, that, that this can be the first industrial use of space. This can be that finding the treasure in space and bringing it back to the economic center, bringing it back to Earth, where you know where you convert your, you know, you used to convert your gold to really nice houses, you know, in, 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 in the days of the Wild West, and now we're going to convert our Zeeblin into probably rocket rides uh, <laughs> uh, today. And so at Main Space, we're actually we're actually building and flying a payload to do this. Um, today we go, you know, we have agreements with, with NASA and cases to actually build a box and, and manufacture of between 100 and 1,000 meters of the optical fiber in the lower in, in a persistent microgravity environment on the ISS. So we're going to manufacture this. The payload will uh, we're on a SpaceX flight. Um, when that flies, hopefully over the summer, we'll fly it, manufacture it, bring the payload down, open it up, study it, and utilize it, study it itself. Um, so this is going to be, we're really, really excited about this because this will be the first time that we actually use space to chip, to create a product that is valuable on the ground because it was manufactured in that environment. We're, just, we're fundamentally changing the way we're interacting with space. So, What's what's next after that? Uh, well, ultimately, you know, this we'll, we'll be able to operate on ISS um, and prove this out. You know, kind of get our get our feet under us um, for a few payloads. But the ultimate ambition is to be manufacturing not you know a kilometer of material, but like thousands of kilometers of material. And and that translates into you know uh, you know like it's about like you know there's about four kilometers of material per kilogram you know, of of fiber. Which I guess I'm kind of totally past that. So the interesting thing about the market today, why, why does this actually matter? Uh, 
the fiber, this fiber today sells for like 100 to $300 a meter. Which means, you know, it's, which means it sells for over hundred thousand dollars a kilogram. Which means that I can I can pay sixty thousand dollars a kilogram to go to space and still have a profit, which is what which goes back to the economic argument. Go back and goes back and says, hey, we can actually use space to add value and then sell it for and sell it for and actually sell it into a real market. So today we do this on ISS. Tomorrow maybe we do it on a you know. In, 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 its own, you know, in, in a big part of ISS. And then ultimately, the ultimate goal of this is to have a factory, to have factory and factory workers in space that do this. So this is a highly robotic process. Um, so we may not actually need people for the for Z Blade, but eventually we'll need people, or my guys will say, hey, we're making enough money and send us to go you know, babysit the machines. Um, but that's the ultimate goal, is, is using space in a way that, that benefits people on the ground. In, in a completely different way than like making our folks go faster, uh, and that, and, and, and ultimately we want to do that so that we can, you know, so that people can live. In uh, I guess I should say that, and, and, and Mike had a great, uh, a great kind of, uh, you know, throwing for me that, that you know, we are. So when I came here a year ago, uh, it, it, it was a little bit smaller crowd than it is now, so it's really great to see, to see this crowd. We were like like 15, uh, doubled in size last year. And we're probably going to you know, add at least another, at least another 15 or so this year, or so, and as well as interns. So, for my own shameless plug, like, please go to our website if you if you'd like to be a part of this. Go to our website. Um, you know, you you folks are always the one, you know, are always the ones that uh, are high demand um, for what we're doing. So please come, uh, and if you'd like to be a part of this, we have internships both during school, over the summer, as well as uh, you know, full time, full time. So, thank you. Probably familiar with them. 
Um, they're the world leader in making high quality EC blend all around. They have the purest reform. So through that, we can shorten a lot of the, you know, shorten a lot of the learnings uh, cycle uh, that you know would be necessary. But it, you know, kind of give you guys an idea of the difficulty of this. We're taking uh, the way that you make see, the way that you make optical fiber on the ground is these tall drawn towers. They're like two stories more tall, and you like heat up a heat up a glass rod and you pull fiber or it drops and you pull it. Uh, and so we have to take this thing that's like two feet, you know, not two feet, two stories tall, and shrink it down to a box that's like the size of a light ring. Uh, so that's been fun, and it worked, and it's working right. It's working now, uh, but it's been. Fun. Um, so, from just what I understand, I'm not like an expert in space stuff necessarily, but uh, for computers, computational power in space seems to be a pretty big problem, especially with radiation. Um, what kind of computational challenges do you guys have? I'm imagining, given the length of a 3D printing job, that corruption to like a, a file coming into the issue. Like, what kind of stuff do you guys see on that? Yeah, so this is, uh, so, so, the, so the question is about like, you know, computational challenges in space. Uh, and, and historically, what we did is we historically the way that space, the way that aerospace companies have handled this is they developed like rad hardened processors, and the rad hardened processors are like 15 or 20 years behind, you know, what what's in our pockets today. Like it's like 486s, um, you know, that were, are, 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 were the standard. And, and we've had this shift to saying, hey, we can just fly and then have. Uh, you know, have fault checks on more modern electronics. So our equipment that we have now has um, <laughs> has like a netbook in it. Um, you know, has like a, a fairly a fairly low power computer in it, um, and we do like you know checksums and things like that to make sure it functions. Um, since we're on ISS, we have some some nominal radiation protection. Uh, though we did go over the South Atlantic anomaly for, um, like two weeks ago, and had and we're pretty sure that we had like a like a, a gamma ray strike. That reset our reset like a, a single a single event was that a reset reset the three D printer. Um, so then we like you know then we restarted it. Um, but yeah, those are those those are our considerations. Um, what we you know what we typically do is do as much computation on the ground and just send like simple stuff to space. Um, you can also have you know sort of parallel path like uh, one of the things that SpaceX does is they have three sort of non rad hard computers that are all doing computation and, like you know. You know, if one goes squirrely, the other two say, "Well, you're just going to sit in the corner for a while." Yeah, good question. Uh, what's the environmental cost of shipping the materials to be manufactured and then back down? I know there are plans to offset that environmental cost. That's a good question, um, and I and I, and I don't really answer that. Um, it, 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 this is kind of one of the things maybe back to the layering conversation from earlier. That uh, NASA and uh, EPA do an environmental impact assessment because um, they launch because they want to launch in, in the Cape, which is in the middle of like you know, protected, uh, you know, a protected environment, uh, and they actually they actually do an environmental impact study and say, hey, you can only launch this many because it will, you know, in order to avoid adversely impacting the surrounding environment. So. Uh Besides 3D printing, what do you think, like what tools would be needed to have a space column? To have a space column? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, essentially, you need everything to be sustainable. Um, you know, you want to you wanna be able to go to the moon, for example, and take local resources and feed and, you know, ultimately feed, clothe, and provide, you know, provide oxygen for, for people. So you need, Manufacturing, you need uh, power systems, you need, you need life support systems, um, you need to be able to recycle waste, grow food. Um, there's a, you know, the list goes on. Uh, but really, you know, it's a think about everything you have in your house, and you think about how do I actually provide all those things, plus the air and also you know, a benign radiation environment. You know, that. Yeah, how do you compare space based manufacturing for terrestrial use versus other terrestrial zero G things like free ball, bomb and comet kind of stuff? It's a great question. So so the question was um, how do we how does you know manufacturing in space, zero G in space versus um, ways that we can access zero gravity on the ground here on Earth, how do those compare? Um, a company like Blue Origin and Ryan 
ride a suborbital flight, sort of like uh, Alan Shepard, and you get maybe like three minutes of microgravity time at the cleaner. It turns out that if you want to, that, that if you want to make like industrial amounts of materials, depending on the application, you need more than three minutes. Um, there are some materials, uh, like silicon carbide, for example, um, is being uh, reprocessed on parallel flight aircraft because they can heat it up and cool it down in that 20 seconds and, and, and actually get some improvement. And so that's really amazing. Um, with Z-Blam, um, I actually would really like to be able to go on a part, or like just go on a suborbital rocket. Um, it would be uh, easier. Um, but that, but it turns out that we need on the order of like hours to, to manufacture, you know, a kilometer or so, um, rather than minutes. So on, on the printer uh, today, we print with ABS, our, our material from the previous, from the first printer, we print in a, 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 a green polyethylene, as you mentioned. Um, that's really useful for like radiation shielding and it's food safe and things like that. Um, we also uh, print in poly, uh, polyether iodine, uh, the trade name is Ulta. Uh, and, and that material actually can survive in the vacuum of space. So we can make spacecraft structures on the station and put them outside. It's really cool. Um, we are printing in like peaks and pecs uh, uh, in the office, and we, we've actually validated like 40 different polymers and, and like carbon filled and CT filled materials that we can print with this machine just fly them to the customer and say, we want that. Um, we've also done a lot of metal, um, aluminum, and steel in the lineup. Um, so that's just kind of waiting for the waiting for use. Sure. So, factoring in the cost of launching the raw materials up and then bringing the uh, manufacturing materials down. The, um, these products being uh, sold to economic centers around Europe would be really expensive. You have, um, how, it, um, how many factories or how big factories do you think you need in order to turn on some sort of profit? So, the way that we're trying, the way that we're approaching this is that uh, that, that first box for building. Uh, microwave science can make like 100, you know, maybe 100 meters, maybe a kilometer material. That will be roughly possible. And we'll scale it up, um, <coughs> pack it really tightly and scale it up and make and, and continue to be continue to be revenue generating and, and profitable there. Um, if we when we get to the scale of like you know laying lines across the Atlantic and things like that, or like enabling big you know, big server farms, big very efficient server farms. That's probably going to require either a free flyer, like buying a rocket, which would be really cool, or going to a commercial uh, space station. Uh, but you know, really, the, the, our our objective, our responsibility, in doing this is to try to find, try to find the sort of minimum viable product that scales, uh, be profitable you know, along the way. Uh, in, the, in you know, future materials, um, you know, like uh, Jeff Bezos, for instance, like in April gave a talk, was talking about doing. Uh, like manufacturing uh, uh, computer chips in space, moving those factories to space. That's that's a huge endeavor. That's going to require like many, many, you know, platforms uh, to to satisfy, you know, the demand of Earth. Um, but you know, we're we're starting small and then you know, hopefully driving the demand and showing other people to say, hey, we could, you know, we did this, and so it doesn't sound so crazy to make computer chips in space. Thank you.